When you say technical writing to someone, most often the first thing that they're going to think of is documentation. Documentation or instructions, procedures, protocol, specifications are the bread and butter of technical writing. But that doesn't mean that just technical writers document things, or even to scientists and engineers. In fact, most people have to write documentation of some kind at some point in their career, whether it's to educate someone on how to do something, to train a new employee, or to guide the work of customers. Today, I'll give you some tips for writing documentation that's user-friendly. That is, it centers the end user, the person who's going to be engaging with the documentation to do a thing, in order to make sure that the process is as seamless as possible for them. As I said, documentation isn't just technical writing per se, and it's not just things like user manuals or help guides. Documentation as a genre has lots of different purposes. It can be used to teach or train someone, to guide someone's work through protocol or procedures, Think about things like lab manuals. To support the work of others, let's say you know how to do something really well and you want to show other people how to do it so you can maximize efficiency in your office. You would write documentation for that. Or to serve as a reference when someone gets stuck doing something or if they forget how to do it. As you can see, there are lots of different functions of documentation, both inside and outside of the workplace. Here are a couple of examples of everyday documentation from my own life. I am a technical communicator and I teach technical writing to students, but I also engage in writing documentation every day for a variety of other purposes beyond just my teaching and research. For example, this is a set of instructions that I wrote down to teach a woman in my grandmother's retirement community how to send someone a message on Facebook to wish them a happy birthday. It was written on the back of some scratch computer paper. And as you can see, it's really low fidelity, right? It's kind of scribbled out or sketched because I did it on the fly. She said that she had a need to wish someone a happy birthday. And so I just got my pen and paper out and diagrammed the steps for her with a couple of little um, sketches of buttons in Facebook Messenger. Additionally, documentation can serve as protocol or training documents for folks who take over a job. If you ever have a position that's brand new and you take it over and then you leave that position, you probably find yourself writing documentation for your successor. This is a document that I wrote when I worked for an LGBT resource center at another university outside of Purdue. I was the first person to have the, the position of media assistant at the center. So when I left the position after two years, I had to give some instructions about how to update the center's website and how to manage the center's social media. So I created a set of protocol for the new hire who replaced me once I graduated. And that included these statistics on the social media reach of the center. Not only did this give instructions for how to manage social media for the office, but it also gave a baseline of our social media reach at the time that I had the position so that they could track the expansion of that reach over time. In addition to helping train the new hire, this also helps justify the need for this position. So documentation can help show why your job is important and help you to continue being employed or maybe to even get a raise. So how do we write documentation? Richard Johnson Sheehan's technical writing textbook, Technical Communication Today, gives a set of structure for documentation or procedures. First, you need to provide the title of your procedure and then an introduction and background. You can't just launch straight into the steps, the bread and butter of the documentation, the numbered steps that uh, you use to get the thing done, you have to first give some context or background as well as a title for the document of what the user is going to be doing. Then after providing the necessary introduction, you give a list of materials. 
If you've ever assembled furniture, this is really uh, familiar, right? You have the parts in the furniture package, as well as any tools that you might need. A Phillips head screwdriver, a wrench, some wood screws. This might also be conditions that you need to get something done. Then you get into your steps. These are a numbered or ordered list with one action per step so the user does not get confused. Then, once you're done giving the steps, you'll give a conclusion. Don't just leave your documentation as is with the final step. Congratulate or thank your reader or provide some next steps. Maybe if they've assembled some furniture, you want to give some tips on how to place it or anchor it to the wall in the case of a dresser to make sure that it doesn't harm any children or pets in the household. Then finally, you'll give information on troubleshooting if necessary. If someone's completed these steps and they're dissatisfied with the results of their assembly or their work, maybe there's someone they can contact, or maybe there are additional steps they can take to make sure that they're satisfied. If you're in one of my classes and you're watching this video, send me an email recommending a TV show you think I should watch, and I'll give you five extra credit points. In addition to following the procedures that Johnson Sheehan outlines in his textbook, good documentation tends to have three distinct features or moves that it takes. It stages, coaches, and alerts the user. Think of this as a set of steps, one, two, three, generally in this order, but you might move between staging, coaching, and alerting as well throughout a set of instructions. Staging involves setting up the scene for the user, giving an intro, a definition, that list of terms and parts, getting them ready to do the tasks that the documentation supports. Coaching involves helping the user through the steps, giving descriptions, maybe providing images or figures, diagrams, notes, or even some encouragement. Maybe you're telling them how to do a thing that's very detailed or very long and arduous. Encouraging them helps them to not give up and helps to minimize the stress and the friction between the user and the tasks they're trying to complete. Then finally, alerting. We'll talk a little bit more about types of alerts later, but generally you want to highlight issues that the user might experience so that they don't become issues. Letting folks know what problems they might come up against while assembling something or completing a task will help them become less frustrated and again, reduce the friction between them and the tasks that they're trying to complete. And in worst case scenarios, you can provide them with additional support through notes, warnings, or additional contact information for help. Images and figures are a really important component of that coaching and alerting. Here are a couple of examples from previous students of mine who have completed documentation projects. This is from a student who created a really comprehensive set of images and written steps teaching his classmates how to lift weights. As you can see here, there's a very clear sequence of pictures outlining how to just warm up for the first step. This continued throughout the document with very detailed images to ensure that his classmates could lift weights effectively and also safely. Here's another example from a student who was teaching her classmates how to cut out an image and delete the background using Adobe Photoshop. As you can see, the screenshots here are essential in guiding the reader through the procedure and teaching them how to avoid issues when engaging with these functions in the Adobe Creative Cloud Suite. As I mentioned earlier, alerts also help to minimize problems for the user, sometimes in ways that traditional steps or even images showing how the job is supposed to be done cannot. You can see that alerts exist on kind of a continuum. Think about it like a stoplight. A note, generally you still got a green light. You're saying to the user, go ahead, but here are some things you might wanna take note of, or here are some problems that might come up for you. Warnings and cautions are like a yellow light on a stoplight. 
you're warning the user about potential problems that could lead to injury or to inconveniences or things like compromised data. Uh, documentation warnings are always to try and prevent loss of limb or loss of life. A common warning when you're engaging in documentation for software or for other digital um, tasks or tools is to warn folks to safeguard their personal information or to not do anything that could compromise their privacy online. This is a place where a caution is really appropriate. Then danger is the strongest type of alert. It's like a red light saying stop, do not enter. This is often used in things like power tools, lawn mowers, dangerous chemicals. Danger is warning readers about the possibility of serious or fatal injury to themselves or others. You're likely, you're unlikely to be writing documentation that requires a danger alert, but knowing that these alerts exist on a continuum and should be used to guide the user away from potentially harmful actions is really important. So those are the basics of documentation writing. Hopefully now you can recognize how you might use documentation in your everyday life, both in the office or the workplace, as well as perhaps in your personal life when teaching other people how to do things or when guiding the work of others. So now it's your turn to take what you've learned from this video and put it into practice, writing your own sets of instructions. Mo is available by email to help. Happy writing!